bits and bones, my name is Lady V, and welcome to my channel. A while ago I wrote an article called A Lesson in POV from a would-be boring graphic novel. I was inspired to revisit it after watching To the Future's video on The Problem with Neil Gaiman, which I highly recommend checking out, it'll be linked in the card above this video. What he describes in his short video essay is how some of Neil Gaiman's most famous works, from American Gods to Sandman, don't work in a traditional narrative structure. His works feel like an overarching web of a universe, vaguely followed through one protagonist, but the whole thing becomes a bit like little arcs or short stories rather than a linear journey. I recently put up a quick review of Gaiman's Ocean at the End of the Lane, which I absolutely loved, and To the Future did too, because it was more singular, short, and conclusive as a work. But overall, we both couldn't quite get into Gaiman's scattered manner of storytelling otherwise. Who knows? Maybe that will change someday. But for now, anyway, after watching To The Future's video on this fundamental difference, and in some people's cases, problem with Gaiman's writing, also applied to the other one that I've read, called The Graveyard Book. And at the time, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, why the graveyard book hadn't hooked me or engaged me half as much as I felt like it should have. Many times while reading the graveyard book, I looked at the main character, realized I'd spent a chapter with him and gotten absolutely no character development, and the adventures he went on had no consequences, and asked myself, why am I still reading this? But I was still reading it. Because aside from that, that fundamental progression that we expect out of a story, the world itself and the adventures were amusing enough to convince me to keep discovering it. Because Neil Gaiman's strength isn't narrative structure, it's narrative chaos, and it's so good, but like To the Future also experienced, it's unfortunate because Gaiman doesn't set himself up for that. Gaiman promises a payoff, then drags you around everywhere else instead, and depending on the reader you are, getting blue-balled like that is really frustrating. In the graveyard book, Gaiman draws us in with the mysterious murder of Bod's family and how he ended up living in the graveyard, and he gives us the promise that the bad man is determined to come back for him. That tension and expectation is set. Then, we spend the entire novel going on one-off adventures with Bod, until at the very, very final pages, we catch a glimpse that maybe the evil man will appear again in the next issue. Which is hard to believe when you've been led around this whole time already without a hint of him. If Gaiman set his stories up more as check this world out rather than follow this character, I think it would be a lot less jarring. So anyway, I found it really interesting that To the Future, pointing out this fundamental flaw slash strength of Gaiman's work correlated with my conclusions about why I didn't like the Graveyard book but still read it anyway. The Graveyard book I read was a graphic novel, I'm not sure if there's another version, so it was easier to identify, I think, than something like American Gods as to where Gaiman's strengths lie. Gaiman is great at building an interesting world, but not in providing a proper character journey to display it, and it was the world that kept me reading despite the lacking characters. I describe the phenomenon of how he achieves this in the article I wrote, which I will now read and elaborate a little bit more afterwards because my original diagrams to explain the matter of perspective Gaiman uses sucks. <laughs> so here we go. A lesson in POV from a would-be boring graphic novel. How a great point of view can save a story. There are many kinds of POV, point of view, one can use to tell a story. And once that story is done, we're expected as writers to step back and define it. How is your story told? First person, third person, the elusive second person, is it past tense, present tense, is the POV limited or omnipresent? Categorizing the type of POV in which a story is told is far more important to the writer than the reader. When you're pitching a story, it feels like it's a make or break whether you have the right POV to intrigue a publication. You can be out of the running based on your story's tense rather than anything to do with the actual content. Readers, on the other hand, don't have to think about POV much at all. If you have an inclination to one or another, you'll gravitate toward it, but if the POV is seamlessly written, the illusion complete, there's little need to acknowledge which one they may find themselves consuming. I believe this holds true, for the most part, for all written works, short stories, novellas, novels, poetry. So long as I have a vague grasp of where the POV sits, I can easily slip into it as a reader and not question specifically whether I'm the main character or the narrator. 
It all just unfolds through the description. If you actually visualize first-person POV through the eyes of the imaginary character and not, and not still as a third-party observer reading, I commend you on your thorough implantation. That said, as someone who digests all forms of written POVs roughly the same, I was thrown back while reading something different, a graphic novel. Specifically, The Graveyard Book, Volume 1, by Neil Gaiman. Why? Because the only thing I liked about it was the POV. About The Graveyard Book. There is narration in The Graveyard Book found in yellow blocks which describe the underlying reality of the scenes, all the things that we can't see or infer on our own. This is usually used to describe what the main character, Bod, is thinking without using thought bubbles. Although there are speech bubbles, The Graveyard Book stays away from thought bubbles. This removes a sense of first-person POV one usually gets in graphic novels and detaches readers further from the main character they're following. The Graveyard Book doesn't express Bod's unvoiced feelings much more than state them as facts. He feels uneasy. He does this. We're left to infer Bod's true thoughts through his face slash actions, visually expressed on the page. I would normally pass the sort of detached storytelling off as third-person omnipresent, but it's more than that. Because the graveyard book is about a young boy, of which we first meet as a toddler and has no way of expressing himself individually, there's an added open and undefined nature to the shape of the story. We have a main character, but we don't have a character lens. At all. Bod is plain to the point of boredom. He acts exactly as any generic child would. I can't describe him by anything apart from being everything a normal child is. Curious, naive, willful yet helpless. The Graveyard Book is a collection of events throughout Bod's childhood, but they are more in a style of one-off adventures than an overarching or thickening plot. The only thing that gathers the reader's intrigue is the beginning and the end of the book which allude to shady dealings outside Bod and entirely unaware of by him. So it got me wondering, what actually compelled me to read the graveyard book the whole way through? Was it the promise that the opening would eventually circle back? I'd argue not, considering I found much of the middle dragged, because I was so apart from any character that I liked or could relate to. No, it was the POV that kept me reading. Point of view saves the day. I can't speak to the sequels, but volume one of the graveyard book was not actually a story of a young boy named Bod. It was about the world he lives in. I kept reading because the promise of the world around Bod. As I mentioned, I found him quite boring and not unique, but through his adventures, I got to know some of the strange, intriguing things that exist in the universe. There were different spins on ghouls and shapeshifters, mysteries of the Grey Lady and Silas and whoever the Slayer are. It dawned on me the importance of different kinds of POV and narration. If the graveyard book were strictly written, I certainly would have given up on it. You can't have a blank slate character in novel format. It's uninteresting. Even in third-person narrative, it wouldn't work because we'd still be following around an unidentified character. Only through a graphic novel could the graveyard book achieve the effect of showcasing an interesting world apart from the character it needs to so loosely tie itself to. In novel format, this environmentally driven story would end up something like The Lord of the Rings, to which I say, exactly. <laughs> I am not very much a fan of the writing style of Tolkien. I'd imagine the novel version of The Graveyard Book to pound readers with scene description. Luckily, graphic novels make this POV work with a visual aid. Graphic novels add something more to the possibilities of POVs as we commonly define them. Something special. In novels, we're held hostage by world description, forced to read it or skip paragraphs, but graphic novels provide the ability to pick and choose what we value, what details are worth lingering on. Visual representations. Here's a small diagram to visualize what I think explains this best. In diagram one, we are the reader, standing back from a doorway. The doorway is the book, and everything on the other side of it is its content. In most cases, we have a character standing in the doorway as our vehicle, but also our block. We can only see bits of the world past them, defined by their silhouette and or their being. We're also lent what they see as they stare straight ahead on their narrative through the world, but it's only described in their words. In diagram two, we stand in the doorway. The character is within our field of vision, but they are separate, standing out in the world. And we are allowed the autonomy to look around into the world and take it in for ourselves when we'd previously, through writing, only been allowed peripheral blurs of the world outside the character's presence. Diagram 2 is the beauty of graphic novel POV. The graveyard book was so intriguing because it was a showcase of the world, not Bod the character. 
I read it because I was allowed to look around at everything outside of Bod. My experience was not defined by him, a need to like him, or restricted to what he thought or felt about the world. The world just was. <laughs> As much as I feel as though the Graveyard Book lent itself to the appeal of old comic books and younger children that want one-off stories and easy sittings, I think it served as a great writerly eye-opener. We don't think about perspective as much as readers, but the perspective of this graphic novel was the only thing that saved it as a story from a DNF, and that's a powerful thing. As the world leans more towards insta-poetry, graphic novels, memoir, comics, etc., perhaps as a writer, you might want to consider other representations of your story? Would it benefit from visual compliments? Is it only possible through visual compliments? So I hope you found that interesting, and I hope that my original article described it well enough, but I'll draw my diagrams in time here again so it's a bit better expressed. In a regular novel, the world of the book is everything on the other side of this wall here, and here's you in real life. The book is the doorway to this other fantastical world in which you can see it through. In third person, there's a character standing in your way, defining the world you can see through what and how they interact with it. In first person, you essentially become the character, and you can feel like you are on the threshold of this world, but you are still limited by that character's sight lines. You can only see what they see. You can only feel what they feel, or you will only be described things in the way that they interpret them. But in a graphic novel, you take the place of the character. Things are visual, not just described. You have a choice to interpret things how you want. For example, look at this table. <laughs> if you're reading a novel, the character perspective might describe it as a crappy fold-out table. They're adding that connotation, that it's crappy. But in a graphic novel, I can literally see the table, and I might not characterize it that way. It's a durable, fold-out table that stood the test of time. I get to look and decide for myself how I feel about the table. <laughs> if that makes sense. So in the Graveyard Book, because it's a graphic novel, I'm standing here and given full reign over the world I see, and the main character is simply in it. Sure, it follows Bod, but he's not commenting on or shaping my opinion or ability to internalize other characters or environments. My worldview is much larger than the character itself, in a way, and because of that, the world of the Graveyard Book had enough intrigue and personality apart from the main character to entice me to read it. So, like, isn't that kind of interesting? How the perspective of a graphic novel complements Gaiman's chaotic way of storytelling enough to drag me along when I know for a literal fact if I read this as a straight text novel, I would not have liked it at all. I haven't read more of Gaiman's work than the ones that I've mentioned, nor watched the TV adaptations of them, but I am really interested to see how the use of different mediums both changes and complements different forms of storytelling. You can expect to see more Gaiman commentaries in the future. Let me know how you feel about Neil Gaiman. What have you read by him, and how do you feel about his unique style of storytelling? I'd be really interested to know. And if you've watched the To The Futures video, let me know which side you're on in terms of Gaiman's storytelling. Are you engaged, or are you a bit miffed when everything gets super off track and winds into nowhere? <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Special thanks to my patrons. If you'd like to support me and my content, you can find a link to my Patreon in the description below. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.